Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hemp. I'm Janice. And this is Quick Study Television, a television program designed to take you through the Bible in one year. And we do that. We're in the books of Moses. We today. are. Again, we're still in Exodus. So anyway, Corey is helping us. Corey, what's up? Today we are going to be taking a look at tr the tradition of cow and calf worship that we see pop up here in Exodus. Cow and calf worship. That is interesting. And mm -hmm. you are doing yes. something. What are you doing? Well, one of your favorite things. Oh, no. I have a question for all of you from Exodus chapter 31. Make sure you read it. Exodus 31. Okay. Ryan, you're going to help me answer this question. So what are you doing today? Well, today I'm talking about the striking of the rock by Moses. When he strikes the rock a second time, God, as punishment, forbids him entry into the promised land. Why such a harsh punishment? All right, that's very good. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about wisdom and understanding and also knowledge soon to come. Recorded in Exodus is the infamous incident of the golden calf idol that was created, of course, by Aaron at, uh, by the pressuring of uh, the Israelites uh, when they were afraid that Moses had died up on Mount Sinai. He had been gone for so long. Right now, you and I are going to trace the roots of this idol worship, specifically related around this calf. Ancient symbolic use of the bull, cow, and calf are well known from ancient documents, artifacts, and the Bible. Take, for instance, the popular biblical example of the Israelites' golden calf idol after they had escaped their slavery from Egypt. And hundreds of years later, Jeroboam, king of the newly split tribes of Israel, with his creation of two golden calf idols. This worship and imagery of cows and calves is general and widespread in ancient Mesopotamia. But both of these biblical examples have direct connection with Egypt. The Israelites and Jeroboam had escaped or returned from Egypt. The ancient Egyptians worshipped a couple deities using bull and cow imagery. They had an entire sacred bull cult dedicated to the life and death of the god of the underworld, involving cycles of worshipping and slaughtering living bulls. Even more known is their worship of the cow goddess Hathor. She was sometimes depicted as a full cow and sometimes as a human with a cow's head or ears. The cow was seen as life-giving and as sustaining life through her milk. It was even said of the pharaohs that they were nursed by this goddess, emphasizing the importance and divine nature of the king's rule, sustained and raised on divine milk or energy. Many believe that it is this goddess the Israelites were venerating when they had Aaron craft them a calf idol in Exodus 32. It's possible they believed they were in need of divine sustenance and so reached out to this familiar pagan deity. While the worship of pagan deities and the crafting of idols are strictly forbidden by God in the first two commandments of Exodus 20, the Bible still makes use of the helpful imagery or symbolism associated with bulls and cows. Powerful and formidable, bulls were tremendously useful in agriculture, and it's clear that they came to be seen as representative of strength and power. Now, many of us, when we read through the book of Exodus, we are already aware of the Ten Commandments. We're already aware that there was a law of God given through Moses to Israel. But we have to remember, so, so we get really easily frustrated with the Israelites here when they make this calf idol. But it's important for us to, to always keep in mind that the law of God had not yet been given to the Israelites. They had been living uh, for generations in the pagan culture of Egypt, yes, uh, still clinging to their, their tribal identity as children of Jacob. But we have to remember, uh, Abraham was full, first called out, and then it was only two generations removed from Abraham. When Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob 
Jacob. And it was Jacob and his sons that went into Egypt originally. Uh, so God called out Abraham and made a covenant relationship with Abraham. And those were the forefathers of the Israelites, but there wasn't a defined covenant, a written out covenant uh, that they were to follow. So it's not uh, entirely surprising that they adopted many Egyptian customs because that's where these Israelites were born and raised. They were raised as uh, the descendants of Abraham in Egypt. So they would have adopted many of those cultural practices. So this is the reason why God takes them to Sinai and he writes a covenant arrangement with them to essentially become their king. And Israel had to agree to this covenant. Unquestionably, human creativity is matchless compared to the absolute creativity of the Holy Spirit. In fact, the articles of the tabernacle were styled by artists filled with the Holy Spirit as they worked. Clearly, God was involved. Moses or Aaron did not decorate the tabernacle and its utensils. It was the direct intervention of God Almighty, His creativity and His work. Exodus 31 lists those that God chose to design articles. God specifically told us that he put the Spirit of God in the men who did the work. In today's society, the use of the word inspired comes easily. It's hard to understand the difference between divinely inspired and humanly inspired. Exodus 31, verses 1 through 11. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship, to design artistic works, to work in gold, in silver, in bronze, in cutting jewels for setting, in carving wood, and to work in all manner of workmanship. And I, indeed I, have appointed with him Aholiab, the son of Ahizamach, of the tribe of Dan. And I have put wisdom in the hearts of all the gifted artisans, that they may make all that I have commanded you, the tabernacle of meeting, the ark of the testimony and the mercy seat that is on it, and all the furniture of the tabernacle, the table and its utensils, the pure gold lampstand with all its utensils, the altar of incense, the altar of burnt offering with all its utensils, and the laver and its base, the garments of ministry, the holy garments for Aaron the priest, and the garments of his sons to minister as priests, and the anointing oil and sweet incense for the holy place. According to all that I have commanded you, they shall do. Exodus chapter 31, verses 1 through 11. As we continue to go through the book of the Exodus, it is amazing. And the book of the Exodus tells us much about Israel. Israel started off at the beginning of the book in Egypt. And Egypt was coming down on Israel because they were afraid of her. And then, of course, Israel gets out of Exodus or out of Egypt. And then now in this wilderness, here they are. And they're learning all about what God desires of them. And really, it's a 12-day journey up to the uh, promised land. But they take 40 years because they don't see what's happening. And we'll get to that in a moment. But it's important to get your Bible guide out. If you don't have your Bible guide, write to us at the American address and at the Canadian address. Be happy to send you a Bible guide. 32 pages written every single month. Brand new stuff. We'll send it to you in advance or go to 
BibleDiscoveryTV.com, BibleDiscoveryTV.com, and click on Donate, Donate Any Amount, and we'll send it to you. You can get uh, your copy of the PDF files. Very interesting. Now, as I looked at works of faith here, I thought, you know what? There's only one way to talk about this because I think the Holy Spirit and the ultimate creative force. So Holy Spirit, the creative force. A lot of people do not see the Holy Spirit as a creative force, but I do because that's important. We read Exodus 30 to 33. We're going to focus on Exodus 31 verses 1 to 11. As we do this, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, help us to hear your word. Help us, Lord, to understand what you're saying to us. Speak to the individuals on the other side of the camera. Now, as we look at this, we need to understand what God is doing. So listen carefully. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, See, I have challenged, or I have called by name, Beziel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God. I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge, wisdom, understanding, and knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship to design artistic works to work in gold and in silver and in bronze and in cutting jewels for setting, in carving wood, and to work in all manner of workmanship. This is amazing. We look at this and it's stunning. Wisdom, understanding, and knowledge are tools of God's Spirit. In Proverbs, we are promised these same tools, beloved, if we seek God with all our heart, mind, and soul. This is really important. As we begin to think this through and begin to digest in this and begin to realize what God is doing, this really happened. And we need to say, wait a minute, God, you're doing the same thing in wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. And the Bible says that he has deposited and stored up for his righteous ones the wisdom, the knowledge, and the understanding for our asking. Well, I tell you what right now, it makes me want to ask for it. Lord Jesus, give us that wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And if the, the Holy Spirit fills you with creativity, there is nothing better than to be creative in the world. So many people are involved in human creativity and this and that and the other. But the creativity of the Holy Spirit of God is the greatest creativity in the world. I want you to understand that's exactly what God said here. And he is loaded up for this. They're ready to go. Listen to verse six. It says, and I indeed, I have appointed him, Aholiab, the son of Ahizmash, the tribe of the tribe of Dan, and I have put wisdom in the hearts of the gifted artisans that they may make all that I have commanded you. And the tabernacle of meeting, the ark of the testimony, the mercy seat that is on it, and all the furniture of the tabernacle, the table and its utensils, the pure gold lampstand with all of its utensils, and the altar of incense. This is amazing. The altar of burnt offering with all its utensils and the labor and its base. Man, he, God has done amazing things here. God never gives an assignment. God never gives an assignment to one not anointed to fulfill it. We must listen to God's word in our lives. I want to tell you something. It's important to hear that God has called us to this time. How do I know that? because you're existing in this time. Are you alive? Can you breathe? Can you talk? Can you, you know, can hit yourself? Can, can you hear yourself? Can, of course you can. God has put you here. And if you have invited Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life, then God has got you here for a reason. And there is a thing that you're anointed for that no one else can do except you. Now, that's something very serious, and we need to think about that. We don't need to think about what we want to do all the time, but we need to think about, Lord, what do you want me to do? Very, very important. We go to Exodus chapter 31, 10 to 11. It says this, the garments of ministry, the holy garments for Aaron, 
the priest and the garments of his sons to minister as priest and the anointing oil and the sweet incense for the holy place, according to all that I have commanded you, they shall do. Really? You see, God provides for us and he works with the community when we do his perfect will. The garments were made by the artisans. Beloved, we must be prepared to work. That's a good one. Work. I love to work. And we must be prepared to do something. I, I have a foot that goes bad on me every once in a while, but that's okay because it takes a few days to get better and I can work at my computer. But I've always got to work. Working is good. God designed us to work. And if we work, doesn't matter where we work. We can maybe work as cleaning up the street or, or we can work as a janitor or we can work as an executive. We, doesn't matter because people are there who don't know Jesus Christ. People are there who don't know the Lord. And we do. And so, beloved, as I talk to the people who have invited Jesus Christ into their life to be Lord, pay attention because this is what God is saying today. Thank you for staying with us as we continue on through the books of Moses here on Quick Study. It is fascinating. It is. And I'm looking forward to this question that we're going to get in All a right. minute. In a minute. So uh, I got to get ready for that. But, you know, other my other kids are going to help me here with this, too. So anyway, but next time on Quick Study Television, Moses is a man. He's flawed. He is not a perfect person. And we'll talk about that because God speaks to him as such. We'll talk about that and the covenant. That is coming into place next time on Quick Study. Ryan, what are you studying? Well, you know, in Exodus chapter 17, God instructs Moses to strike a particular rock so that water will come out and provide drink for the thirsty, wilderness-wandering Israelites. But then, on a second occasion, years later, Moses is told to only speak to the rock and the water would come out. However, Moses, in his anger, disobeys God and strikes the rock again. For this, God denies him entry into the promised land and gives him an early death. This is a seemingly harsh punishment, and many have wondered what Moses did that was so wrong. Let's study. Exodus chapter 17 records the complainings of the wilderness wandering Israelites. In this particular episode, the people complained to Moses because there is no water to drink. So Moses cried out to the Lord saying, what shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Go on before the people, and take with you some of the elders of Israel. Also take in your hand your rod with which you struck the river, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah. It would be many years later that Moses and the Israelites would return to Meribah and again be in need of water. However, this time, rather than God commanding Moses to strike the rock for water, he commands him to simply speak to it. However, Moses, in his anger and frustration, instead strikes the rock not once, but twice. Though the water does come, Moses, in his disobedience, misrepresents God here. As punishment, God denies Moses entry into the Promised Land and gives him an early death. Many have marveled over this account, wondering what it was Moses did that was so deserving of this punishment. The answer to this mystery is found in the New Testament book of 1 Corinthians. In chapter 10, verse 4, the Apostle Paul reveals that the rock represented Jesus Christ. 
So there were two episodes with The Rock. In the first one, The Rock was smitten and they benefited with living water. The second rock was not supposed to be smitten. If Moses had done what God told him, these rock incidents would have modeled the first and second comings of Jesus Christ. So when Moses struck the rock on the second occasion, he ruined the model. Though Moses would not enter the promised land, as one Bible scholar points out, God was by no means finished with him. He is seen again on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus talking about the second coming. And some believe that he is one of the two witnesses spoken of in Revelation chapter 11. You know, this is another example of why we need to pay attention to both the Old and New Testaments. In today's example, the New Testament passage of 1 Corinthians was key in understanding the whole picture. That, of course, being that the rock represented Jesus Christ, and the first rock represented his first coming, where he was smitten and bruised for our iniquities. And the second rock was supposed to represent Christ's second coming, but Moses in his anger spoiled the image by striking the rock again. Very interesting. You know, it is interesting, and, and I remember uh, <clears throat> recently receiving information from somebody who said, well, you know, I'm not going to read the Old Testament because I don't like it. I'm not going to read it. I just read the New Testament. Turns out they read, you know, just the passages they like in the New Testament. And I tried to encourage them to consider <laughs> reading the Old Testament. And uh, it's really important that we understand the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. And the New Testament is the Old Testament reveal. That's important. And we need to understand that, Ryan. The Bible is a whole book. And we need to take all of it or none of it. That's just the reality. Yeah. And so if I want to read the Bible and I want to say, when I get to heaven, I say, Lord Jesus, thank you for saving me. I, I read your book from Genesis to Revelation. I read it several times and I just need to know exactly what it is that you were saying, but I read it. Mm -hmm. And that is, that is important to say for people to understand. Not that we have to understand every word because I mean, how can we, how can we, right? Well, you know, you can, you can really take a look at it. If you think about nutrition as well, the food that we eat, mm -hmm. when we eat food, we don't know what nutrients that we're getting that our body takes and absorbs, and it's good for us. Mm -hmm. It keeps us healthy and well, and it's the same thing. This is the living word. And so when we are reading it, we may not understand what we're reading, but it keeps our souls and our spirits healthy and well, and it keeps our minds right. Mm -hmm. So we may not understand everything, yeah. but it, it, it's like nutrition and yeah. food. And from a cultural perspective, I mean, in, in the New Testament, if you just start there, you're being plopped into the middle of, of a history of a story. Jesus chose to come. God chose for Jesus Christ to, uh, to, to be revealed at that particular time. And mm -hmm. that culture was built by the events in the Old Testament. So as much as some of us may not like the events that happened in the Old Testament, they happened and they shaped and formed the culture that Jesus came into. So if you really want to understand uh, fully uh, what God was doing, then you have no choice but to read the whole thing. Genesis 3 is the first mention, yeah. of course. So yeah. I mean, all first the way back, back to the beginning. First, yeah, first prophecy. I think that, that it's important for us to recognize and realize that if we are filled with the Holy Spirit, then we can read and understand accordingly. Because the problem is that when you have people reading the Old Testament, they are not filled with the Holy Spirit. They don't understand it because, you know, it's just horrible, you know, this brutality and all of that. But when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you begin to understand what God is saying. He's saying to us that the, the Bible is, if you did a, a story, if you did several movies on the Bible, they would be rated R. They would be because of the way. There's a lot of brutal things it, that have right. happened. It's brutal. Mm -hmm. I get into judges. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's brutal. But you know what? When you understand the Bible as Satan trying to thwart the plans of God throughout the entire text, you know, things really become clear at that point. You realize Satan's attacking, Satan's countering God. God is countering Satan back. 
So there's a lot of spiritual warfare going on there. there is. And there's right. also that's all it also brings up, you know, it's really important not to to build a whole theology or a whole teaching based on uh, uh, something that you read just in the Old Testament or just in the New Testament. You really do, you know, if you if you just stuck with the Old Testament, the story's not finished yet. That's and right. if you just pluck things from the New Testament, you have no idea what the context is. Where is this coming from? You really have to have a broad perspective of all of it to understand what God's saying. And that was part of God's plan. I, I actually think that the, the, the go, ahead, go ahead. No, I was just I was just gonna encourage people if you if you are new, if you're just coming to the Lord or you haven't even received the Lord and you're and you're hearing Rod say, Oh well I, I'm not gonna be able to read it unless I have the Holy Spirit's guidance. You know what? It's important for all of us wherever we are in life, that when we go to, when we come to the Bible, we ask the Lord, we pray before we begin to read for God to help us and to open our eyes and to open our hearts because he will do that wherever you are in life. So don't use another excuse as well. I don't think that I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. So I guess I better not read it because I won't understand it. Don't let the enemy trick you there. Open up the word of God and begin to read and ask God to help you to understand what's happening. And he will. That's right. He will. And the page you should tear out in the Bible is the page between the Old Testament and the New Testament because <laughs> it's all one. Anyway, we got to be quick about this. So what, what oh, is your question? Today? My question is from Exodus chapter 31. Who was from the tribe of Dan? Bezalel or Holiab? Oh, dear. Bezalel or, or Holiab? Who was from the tribe of Dan? Who, who do you think? Beziel? I, I'd be just guessing. It'd be 50-50. No, I, I, I can't know. remember. I think Bezio. There you go. You sure. think so? We'll back you. So. I'll back you. All right. <laughs> Exodus 31, verse 6. And I, indeed, I have appointed him a Holiab, the son of Ahissamach of the tribe of Dan. Oh, no. Sorry, guys. Oh, no. Bezio was from the tribe of Judah. But anyway. Bez that's right. Uh, Son of Ura. It was, it was. It was a tough all. question. You I did. stumped us all. Oh, well. I'm sure some of you at home got the right answer. Good for you. I said that I said you. Anyway, <laughs> uh, it is really important for us to understand that we can be from the tribe of people who have eternal life. If you really understand, if you really know who Jesus Christ is, not was, but is. Jesus Christ died on the cross, but he rose miraculously from the dead in the flesh, seen by over 500 people. And when he did that, he did that for you and for me so that we can have the gift of eternal life, and that gift is available to us. So if you pray and you say, Jesus, I need you to be Lord of my life, if you pray that, then God will come into your life and he will change everything. And you need to recognize that Jesus Christ loves you, that God loves you, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So this is a good thing. Remember to call on Jesus today.